Turn your Bibles to, uh, you think, is he going to ever use the Bible? John, and I've quoted two, three, four verses already. John chapter 6. Used some of this message in chapel the other day. Verse 3. Feeding of the 5,000. Jesus went up into a mountain and he sat there with his disciples and the Passover and the Passover a feast of the Jews was nigh. And when Jesus when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him he saith unto uh saith unto Philip whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. I think Philip was the mathematician in that group. I kind of identify with him. He calculated, figured it out. and I mean, that, that's kind of the organizational guy. That's kind of me. And uh, anyhow, Philip says uh, 200 isn't enough. One of his disciples, verse 8, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there's a lad here. There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but they're not enough. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000, plus the women and children, a lot of people. Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down, Likewise of the fish, as many as they would. And then were filled, when they were filled, he saith, said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled the twelve basket with the, baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten them. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of truth, that prophet that should come into the world. I'm going to preach to you this morning on that phrase out of verse 9. There is a lad here. And I want to challenge you to think about that lad. I mean, he was only a lad. Little kid. Would have been the lightweight ring. Was that lightweight on that side? Would have been the little guy in the lightweight ring. <laughs> I can identify with that. Used to wrestle in high school. Lower weight class. A little bit in college. But uh, yeah, he, he was just a little kid. Didn't have much. Yeah, I mean, you could look at him and say, well, yeah, he, was, he, he wasn't strong. <laughs> he didn't have ability. He was just a, a kid that uh, was there. But I'd like to remind you this morning, it's not up to you or your strength or your ability or your talent. God can save by many or by few. You know, you may be sitting out here, Brother Mike Don brought a tremendous message in College Chapel yesterday. My wife said to me last night, boy, I wish he could preach that at Young Fundamentalist Conference. He said, I went through college. My name was never up front. I was just kind of a nobody, made it through, didn't make who's who. Nobody much knew me. I thought, you know, these other guys can preach and they have talent and they have this and they have that. I just figure I'd go serve God. God's blessed him in a marvelous way and he uses him. Talk about a servant. You may be sitting out here today and say, well, I don't have the talent. I'm not the one they pick. I, you know, I just, I can't preach, can't talk to people. I'm shy. I'm embarrassed. I wouldn't dare get up in there. Somebody'd hurt me. But God doesn't care. I was at Howells Anderson a long time. We had a shy kid come through there, worked on a bus route, and uh, went in and started on a bus route up in Chicago his freshman year. Bus captain was a senior. He graduated, and they thought, now who should we get to be bus captain? And they thought, well, we got this guy. He's already on the route, but he doesn't have any leadership. He couldn't do it. So they found somebody from a different route and brought him in to be the bus captain and, you know, over the fellow who was already there. And I wasn't a part of that decision, but I undoubtedly would have agreed with it. Same thing happened to him at the end of the sophomore year. They found somebody else to come in to replace the senior to be the new bus captain. 
He got passed over three times for bus captain because he didn't have any leadership ability. He couldn't, it wouldn't be able to lead a group of bus workers out there. His name, probably one of the greatest missionaries in the world today, Kevin Wynn. God doesn't care. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of people saved in Mexico City. From a guy that those of us in leadership thought, he doesn't have any leadership ability. He won't be able to do it. God doesn't care. Doesn't make any difference to him if it's your Joe, who's calling it college face men. Oh, great face. Great personality, not much on the inside. God runs your heart. He was, a, he was only a lad. But secondly, let me point out to you, he was there. You know, the disciple there, was it uh, Simon, uh, said, uh, lost my, Philip answered one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew said, hey, there's a lad here. He was there. You know, if he hadn't been there, he couldn't have given his lunch. If he'd have stayed home and said, "Well, you know, I'll watch a football game on Saturday morning," he wouldn't have. He, he couldn't have done it. There's nothing wrong with watching a football game on Saturday morning unless you're supposed to be out bus calling team soul winning something else. He couldn't have volunteered if he hadn't been there. If he'd have just stayed home for a good cause, he wouldn't have been able to volunteer. You want to be sure you're in God's will. You want to get to the place that God has for you. You want to be there. I'm glad, I'm glad somebody knocked on my dormitory door as a, a college student at a secular college and said, we want to invite you to come to our Bible study. I'm glad that guy was there. I'm glad that, uh, you know, as God used me different times in my life that I've been able to be there where I needed to be. You know, God, you need to be there. You need to be in God's will. Some of y'all decide, I'm going to go to Bible college. I'm going to prepare to be. You ought to be there. You want to be where God wants you to be. Say, boy, it would be exciting to be used to God. Well, then you, you take a step or two. Say, it would be neat if I were Kevin Wynn and serving God in a great city and people knew me all around the world and I had hundreds of thousands I'd get to see in heaven that had been one to Christ through my ministry. You know how he got there? He was there on Saturday morning in Chicago. And when people passed on his bus route, it was cold and it was hot. It was too cold to go, he went anyhow. It was too hot to be up there, he went anyhow. When he had a little temperature, he went anyhow. When he felt homesick, he went anyhow. He was there. When he got passed over and snubbed and could have gotten a bad spirit, he said, I just want to be a servant. He went there. I mean, decide, I'm going to, I'm going to be there. there. There, I mean, he was only a lad, but he was there. As I read this story, one of the things that stands out to me is God uses people. I mean, and as you read about the people in this story, the feeding of the 5,000 that God uses, I mean, you know, here's a lad. <laughs> And I don't know when God spoke to him and said, Give your lunch. I just said, Here, I've got something. As far as that goes, God used the disciples to pass out the food. Probably a lot of 5,000 men, women, and children probably used other people to help pass out the food whose name isn't even mentioned, whose names aren't even mentioned. God used people to gather up the food, probably a whole bunch of people whose names aren't even mentioned. God uses people. And God uses anybody that will serve Him. God wants to use you, but you have to be there and you have to be willing. Look, as, as you think about this lad, I mean, why did He give His lunch? I mean... Did God say, give your lunch, son? 
I don't think so. I think he said, well, I'm here. There's a need. I have what's needed. I've got a lunch. They're, they're looking for food. I've got food. Now, what I have isn't enough, but I'll give it to Jesus. He volunteered it. What are you waiting for God to do to speak to your heart and say, Oh, yo, go serve me. I mean, he says that in here. I'm so tired of being out and talking to young people in college and high school. Well, I'm waiting for God to speak to me. Well, he's spoken. He's got a whole book of speaking. Hey, what would God do that would get your attention? Well, maybe if he made me sick. I mean, is that really what you want? If he made somebody I love sick, well, that would tell me. Well, why do you want that? Why don't you just take what's in his book? Like, what, what, how is he going to... I mean, he's spoken to us right here. This poor little fella, poor little fella. <laughs> he's happy in heaven. This lad, he's just sitting there, mind his own business, listening to the preaching. So if somebody said, oh, they're looking for food. He said, well, I don't have much. I don't have it. It's not enough to make any difference, but I'll give what I have. And he volunteered it, gave it to Jesus. Jesus used it, and Jesus made it enough. What you and I have is never enough. But if we give it to Jesus, he'll make it enough. I mean, God wants to use you. God wants to... I don't know, the people who were help passing out the food, help collect the food. I mean, how do you, do you think God spoke to them and said, go get another basket. Now, I'm going to put a twitching in your leg and that'll make you go get. Now, I mean, there's a need you do it. I mean, what else do you want? You've got, where'd my hanky go? Is there Kleenex in here? There's hankies. The, uh. There's a need you do it. That little lad, I mean, he gave everything he had. He had five barley loaves, two small fish. He gave the whole thing. Bible never said he had to. Bible never said, Bible never told him this is what you need to do. He could have kept it and not been wrong. He could have, uh, you know, he could have said, well, I've got five barley loaves, two small fish. Tell you what, I'll give you two, two barley loaves and one of the fish. I've got to have something for me. And that would have, I mean, nothing in the Bible said he, what he, but he decided, hey, there's a need. This is what I got, Jesus. You can have the whole thing. Why don't you decide to give what you have to God? Don't wait for him to take it from you. You know, you give God what you have, let Him do with it what He wants, you'll never be sorry. God's no man's debtor. We're never gonna, nobody's gonna get to heaven and say, God, you shortchanged me. I gave to you more than you ever gave to me, God. God's no man's debtor. Once you and I decide to give what we have to God, give Him the whole thing, say, God, you know, I'm in. You have me. Do what you want to me. It appeared Jesus needed a lot more than what he had to offer. And you may think your life is not valuable. But Jesus will take it if you'll give it. He got put down. The lad got put down for giving his, giving his lunch to Jesus. I mean, Andrew says to him, but what are these among so many? But that didn't stop him. He said, I don't care. I'll give him what I have. You're going to give your life to God? Somebody's going to tell you, well, you don't have enough talent. God couldn't use you. Somebody's going to tell put your camera away. Somebody's going to tell you, you don't, this isn't picture taking time, it's preaching time. Amen. Somebody's going to tell you, well, you don't have enough talent. You need to hang on to what you have. You, you gotta be able, I mean, you know, I mean, you go into ministry, this thing, I mean, what about, what about, what about, what about? Why don't you decide God's going to take care of me? Why don't you decide that 
I mean, we sing a tent or a cottage. Why should I care? They're building a mansion for me over there. But now I'm talking about my life. You know, of course, I got to have benefits and insurance and retirement and a big salary. And I got to have this and I got to have that. And I got to have a nice place. God takes care of you. Amen. He gives you. Sometimes he gives us nice things to enjoy because he loves us. Sometimes he gives us heartache and misery. Because he loves us and he needs to work on us. But I don't know. I mean, if God called you or me to the mission field or whatever, hey, it's about serving him. It's not about, it's about being a benefit, not the benefit package. But people will tell you, well, what you have isn't enough. And people put this lad down and told him what you have isn't enough. But he didn't let his critics stop him. You decide you want to serve God. God's going to call you to preach. God's going to, you want to say, God, I want to present my body a living sacrifice. I want to serve you any way I can. Do whatever I can. For the cause of Christ, you'll have people at home, they'll say, it's not, it won't do any good. You don't have enough. You don't have the talent. You don't have this. You don't have that. God won't. You won't. Da, 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 da. Just decide I'm going to serve God. Amen. I'll tell you, when it comes to being a preacher, a Bible college administrator, a counselor, I want to continue being somebody that will tell. That I, I don't want to be the person that tells people your lunch is too little. I want to be the one that tells young people, your lunch is all Jesus needs. And your lunch and my lunch is too little. What I have to give him isn't enough. But it's all he needs. And what you have to give him is all he needs from you. It's not about, just say, God, I want to serve you. You're 16, 18, 15 years old. You don't know where it's going to lead you. I, mean, I had no idea what I was going to do. I couldn't have surrendered at 16, 18, 22 years of age when I went off to Tennessee Temple Seminary under Dr. Lee Robertson back in those days. Get trained for the ministry. I, had no, I couldn't have said, God, I want to surrender to be a college vice president. I want to be, help start three Bible colleges in my lifetime. Help build them. And There's no way I could have known what God wanted me to do. All I knew is I had something inside my heart that says, God, what I you had you take the lunch. Yes, Amen. I know the first step was get prepared, so I went went to get some training. Amen. Wherever God was going to, however, which direction or where or what, I, I thought maybe a missionary in the Amazon or something, mud hut, dirt floor is fine. I just wanted God to use me. My wife said that was fine too before we married incidentally. You better find a wife that says, yeah, mud hut, dirt floor, I don't care. Just want God to use us. I mean, she said, well, I wouldn't do that. Then go find you another. Because whatever she, whatever you can give her will never be enough. I mean, you know, this boy never dreamed that God would use, going to use him like he did, but God did use him to feed the multitudes. He never thought when he left home that morning, that morning it was going to be the greatest day in his life, but it was. I want to challenge you to volunteer to be used to God. I'm ti- again, I'm tired of people waiting for, saying, well, I'm waiting for God to speak to me. So I'm going to do what I want, which is to, why don't you decide I want to do what God wants? God, why don't you decide, God, I want to give you what I have to meet the need. If I'm going to do what God wants, I'm going to witness to somebody today. Those of you are teenagers, you're going to try and get the gospel to somebody day by day. Attract, teenage soul winning. We ought to carry a burden for this thing. We ought to try to spend our life helping God. Look, you say, well, I'm, I'm, what about God's will? What is God's will? You want to read God's will? I'll read you God's will. John chapter 6, go on into the bread of life discourse there in John 6. Don't turn to it. Let me read it. John 6, verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, Jesus says. You want to know God's will? I'll tell you God's will. God told us his will. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. 
And I will raise him up at that la- at the last day. Hey, God's will is everybody gets saved. That's God's will. Read it in the Bible. This is the will of God that everyone that seeth me and everyone that seeth the Son of you know, If you get saved, you're going to, that's God's will. Well, if it's God's will that people get saved, then maybe it's God's will I ought to tell somebody. That makes sense. So I wonder if that's really what God wants me to do. Well, I read His commandment in Matthew 28, a bunch of other places, and He said, yep, that's what I want you to do. Jesus said, I'm come to seek and to save that which was lost. If that's why Jesus came, maybe that was the purpose of His life, maybe even a good purpose for my life. Maybe it wouldn't be a bad purpose for your life. Well, seek and save that which was lost. Say, well, God, does that mean I'm going to be this? I'm going to be that? I don't know, God. I just I want you to use me. Amen. Don't care where. Don't care how. Don't care what the salary or the benefits are, God. I just want you to use me. I'd like to see 100, 200 guys in here today to say, God, I want you to use me. I'll make a difference. I'll plant a church. I'll pastor a church. I mean, yeah, 100, 200 people on a Sunday. That ought, I mean, God may do more than that. God may lead you in a situation where you never have 100 in church on a Sunday. But if you're faithful in doing what God wants you to do and witnessing, see, but Kevin R. Cole out here somewhere there, down there again, there are not 100 people in 100 miles of his church hardly. I got lost coming out of there one night. I thought I was never going. I took a wrong turn late at night. I thought, man alive, I'm going to get killed out here. Somebody's going to think I'm coming to check on their still or whatever. I thought it might be him. <laughs> but he's reaching a community for Christ. Being faithful. About you. What guy? Hey. Why, why do you want to spend your life going after money? You're leaving it all here. We are going to stay. I mean, I, again, I know when you're 16, it seems like, yeah, I mean, mentally it's in there, but it's not part of your thinking. You get older, you start realizing, hey, it is. I'm going to stand before him someday. Now, a rapture may come tonight. We may all be standing, or, you know, before we're done with it, but we may all be standing before him real soon. Biggest regret you have in serving God is your own sin and the sin of the times that people you love go directly against what you know and what they know is God's will. My biggest disappointment in my life is me. <laughs> But it's never been because I wasn't doing what God because I was doing what God wanted me to do. Never been sorry I did what He said. I get tempted and, and slip or whatever. Hey, I get sorry about that, but I've never been sorry for doing what Jesus told me to do. I mean, you really think we're going to get to heaven someday and, and we're going to stand up and say, God, I mean, you really, God, you really messed me up. Some of you guys. You know, made all tournament team in your high school church league, and you, you, you think you're going to the NBA or play for Kentucky or a second rate program like Duke or Kansas or something. Tennessee. Give me a break. And if you could, and I enjoy basketball, and I enjoy the sports, and I enjoy watching them, played some a little bit, and so on, pick up games. And, but it's no eternal value. I'm going to spend my life serving God. I'm going to challenge you this morning, young men, young ladies, decide I want to spend my life in serving God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Let me get you to stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me ask first off, I wonder if there's somebody here today who'd say, Brother Jorgensen, in a new or different way or for the first time in my life, I'm going to present my life to serve body to serve God. If he wants to use me to pastor, that's fine. I'll stick with a young man. If he wants to use me to pastor, that's fine. Be a missionary, that's fine. Be an assistant pastor, a Christian school teacher, 
Even a godly layman, but I want to present my body in a new way to serve God this morning, different than I have in the past. A surrender to God's will, if you want to use that term. Young men, why don't you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Young men, that would be like that. I see many hands around the auditorium. Anybody else? How many of you? Keep your hands up. How many others of you fellas would say, I've already done that, Brother Jorgensen, but I'm, I'm, I'm in on it. I'm committed. I want to want God to use me anyway. I'm yielded. I want to present my body to serve Him. I'm surrendered. Whatever God wants me to do in my life, I, my hand's up. Anybody else? Amen. Wouldn't it be great, preacher, if put your hands down, if 100 to 200 of these guys would say, I'll go take a city. Ten years from now, we could have 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 in church yes. out of the men in this room. How many of you ladies say, I'll stand with somebody or go up? My life surrendered. God, I want you to use me any way you want me to. Raise your hand. Newer, newer already. In a moment, I'm going to ask the pianist to play when she does, as she begins. If you want to, you can come down and kneel here at the altar. If you raise your hand that this is the first time you've made a decision, I want to serve God. I'm going to pastor. I've yielded. I've anything he wants. You ought to come down and kneel here. Father, I pray that you'd bless these decisions. God, do something in our nation. We need you so. It's so sick. And yet the answer is in God's people. We have the answer in this room this morning. Please do something in the hearts of these young people. In Jesus' name.